Chapter 27 From Joy to Death For ten days the hordes of Thark and their wild allies were feasted and entertained, and then, loaded with costly presents, and escorted by ten thousand soldiers of Helium commanded by Morris Kajak, they started on the return journey to their own lands. The Jed of Lesser Helium with a small party of nobles accompanied them all the way to Thark to cement more closely the new bonds of peace and friendship. Sola also accompanied Tars Tarkas, her father, who before all his chieftains had acknowledged her as his daughter. Three weeks later, Mors Kajak and his officers, accompanied by Tars Tarkas and Sola, returned upon a battleship that had been dispatched to Thark to fetch them in time for the ceremony which made Deja Thoris and John Carter one. For nine years I served in the councils and fought in the armies of Helium as a prince of the house of Tardos Mors. The people seemed never to tire of heaping honors upon me, and no day passed that they did not bring some new proof of their love for my princess, the incomparable Deja Thoris. In a golden incubator upon the roof of our palace lay a snow-white egg. For nearly five years ten soldiers of the Jeddax Guard had constantly stood over it. And not a day passed when I was in the city that Deja Thoris and I did not stand hand in hand before our little shrine planning for the future, when the delicate shell should break. Vivid in my memory is the picture of the last night as we sat there talking in low tones of the strange romance which had woven our lives together, and of this wonder which was coming to augment our happiness and fulfill our hopes. In the distance we saw the bright white light of an approaching airship, but we attached no special significance to so common a sight. Like a bolt of lightning it raced toward Helium until its very speed bespoke the unusual. Flashing the signals which proclaimed it a dispatch-bearer for the Jeddak, it circled impatiently, awaiting the tardy patrol-boat which must convoy it to the palace docks. Ten minutes after it touched at the palace a message called me to the council chamber, which I found filling with the members of that body. On the raised platform of the throne was Tardos Mors, pacing back and forth with tense-drawn face. When all were in their seats he turned toward us. This morning, he said, word reached the several governments of Barsoom that the keeper of the atmosphere plant had made no wireless report for two days, nor had almost ceaseless calls upon him from a score of capitals elicited a sign of response. The ambassadors of the other nations asked us to take the matter in hand and hasten the assistant keeper to the plant. All day a thousand cruisers have been searching for him until just now one of them returns bearing his dead body, which was found in the pits beneath his house horribly mutilated by some assassin. I do not need to tell you what this means to Barsoom. It would take months to penetrate those mighty walls. In fact, the work has already commenced and there would be little to fear were the engine of the pumping plant to run as it should, and as they all have for hundreds of years now. But the worst, we fear, has happened. The instruments show a rapidly decreasing air pressure on all parts of Barsoom. The engine has stopped. My gentlemen, he concluded, we have at best three days to live. There was absolute silence for several minutes and then a young noble arose, and with his drawn sword held high above his head, addressed Tardos Mors. The men of Helium have prided themselves that they have ever shown Barsoom how a nation of red men should live. Now is our opportunity to show them how they should die. Let us go about our duties as though a thousand useful years still lay before us. The chamber rang with applause and as there was nothing better to do than to allay the fears of the people by our example, we went our ways with smiles upon our faces, and sorrow gnawing at our hearts. When I returned to my palace I found that the rumor had already reached Deja Thoris, so I told her all that I had heard. "'We have been happy, John Carter,' she said, "'and I thank whatever fate overtakes us that it permits us to die together.' 
The next two days brought no noticeable change in the supply of air, but on the morning of the third day breathing became difficult at the higher altitudes of the rooftops. The avenues and plazas of Helium were filled with people. All business had ceased. For the most part the people looked bravely into the face of their unalterable doom. Here and there, however, men and women gave way to quiet grief. Toward the middle of the day many of the weaker commenced to succumb, and within an hour the people of Barsoom were sinking by thousands into the unconsciousness which precedes death by asphyxiation. Dejah Thoris and I, with the other members of the royal family, had collected in a sunken garden within an inner courtyard of the palace. We conversed in low tones, when we conversed at all, as the awe of the grim shadow of death crept over us. Even Woola seemed to feel the weight of the impending calamity, for he pressed close to Dejah Thoris and to me, whining pitifully. The little incubator had been brought from the roof of our palace at the request of Dejah Thoris, and now she sat, gazing longingly, upon the unknown little life that now she would never know. As it was becoming perceptibly difficult to breathe, Tardos Mors arose, saying, Let us bid each other farewell. The days of the greatness of Barsoom are over. Tomorrow's sun will look down upon a dead world, which, through all eternity, must go swinging through the heavens, peopled not even by memories. It is the end. He stooped and kissed the women of his family, and laid his strong hand upon the shoulders of the men. As I turned sadly from him, my eyes fell upon Dejah Thoris. Her head was drooping upon her breast, to all appearances she was lifeless. With a cry I sprang to her and raised her in my arms. Her eyes opened and looked into mine. "'Kiss me, John Carter,' she murmured. "'I love you, I love you. It is cruel that we must be torn apart who were just starting upon a life of love and happiness. As I pressed her dear lips to mine the old feeling of unconquerable power and authority rose in me. The fighting blood of Virginia sprang to life in my veins. "'It shall not be, my princess,' I cried. "'There is, there must be some way, and John Carter, who has fought his way through a strange world for love of you, will find it.' And with my words there crept above the threshold of my conscious mind a series of nine long-forgotten sounds. Like a flash of lightning in the darkness their full purport dawned upon me. The key to the three great doors of the atmosphere plant. Turning suddenly toward Tardos Mors, as I still clasped my dying love to my breast, I cried, A flyer, Jeddak! Quick! Order your swiftest flyer to the palace top! I can save Barsoom yet! He did not wait to question but in an instant a guard was racing to the nearest dock, and though the air was thin and almost gone at the rooftop they managed to launch the fastest, one-man, air-scout machine that the skill of Barsoom had ever produced. Kissing Dejah Thoris a dozen times and commanding Woola, who would have followed me to remain and guard her, I bounded with my old agility and strength to the high ramparts of the palace, and in another moment I was headed toward the goal of the hopes of all Barsoom. I had to fly low to get sufficient air to breathe, but I took a straight course across an old sea-bottom and so had to rise only a few feet above the ground. I traveled with awful velocity, for my errand was a race against time with death. The face of Dejah Thoris hung always before me. As I turned for a last look as I left the palace garden I had seen her stagger and sink upon the ground beside the little incubator. That she had dropped into the last coma which would end in death if the air supply remained unreplenished, I well knew, and so, throwing caution to the winds, I flung overboard everything but the engine and compass, even to my ornaments, and lying on my belly along the deck with one hand on the steering wheel and the other pushing the speed lever to its last notch, I split the thin air of dying Mars with the speed of a meteor. An hour before dark, the great walls of the atmosphere plant loomed suddenly before me, and with a sickening thud I plunged to the ground before the small door which was withholding the spark of life 
from the inhabitants of an entire planet. Beside the door a great crew of men had been laboring to pierce the wall, but they had scarcely scratched the flint-like surface, and now most of them lay in the last sleep from which not even air would awaken them. Conditions seemed much worse here than at Helium, and it was with difficulty that I breathed at all. There were a few men still conscious, and to one of these I spoke. "'If I can open these doors, is there a man who can start the engines?' I asked. "'I can,' he replied. "'If you open quickly, I can last but a few moments more. But it is useless. They are both dead, and no one else upon Barsoom knew the secret of these awful locks. For three days men, crazed with fear, have surged about this portal in vain attempts to solve its mystery." I had no time to talk. I was becoming very weak, and it was with difficulty that I controlled my mind at all. But with a final effort, as I sank weakly to my knees, I hurled the nine thought-waves at that awful thing before me. The Martian had crawled to my side, and with staring eyes fixed on the single panel before us, we waited in the silence of death. Slowly the mighty door receded before us. I attempted to rise and follow it, but I was too weak. "'After it,' I cried to my companion, "'and if you reach the pump-room, turn loose all the pumps. It is the only chance Barsoom has to exist tomorrow. From where I lay I opened the second door, and then the third, and as I saw the hope of Barsoom crawling weakly on hands and knees through the last doorway, I sank unconscious upon the ground. Chapter 28 At the Arizona Cave It was dark when I opened my eyes again. Strange, stiff garments were upon my body garments that cracked and powdered away from me as I rose to a sitting posture. I felt myself over from head to foot, and from head to foot I was clothed, though when I fell unconscious at the little doorway I had been naked. Before me was a small patch of moonlit sky, which showed through a ragged aperture. As my hands passed over my body they came in contact with pockets and in one of these a small parcel of matches wrapped in oiled paper. One of these matches I struck, and its dim flame lighted up what appeared to be a huge cave, toward the back of which I discovered a strange, still figure, huddled over a tiny bench. As I approached it I saw that it was the dead and mummified remains of a little old woman with long black hair and the thing it leaned over was a small charcoal burner upon which rested a round copper vessel containing a small quantity of greenish powder. Behind her, depending from the roof upon rawhide thongs and stretching entirely across the cave, was a row of human skeletons. From the thong which held them stretched another to the dead hand of the little old woman. As I touched the cord the skeleton swung to the motion with a noise as of the rustling of dry leaves. It was a most grotesque and horrid tableau, and I hastened out into the fresh air, glad to escape from so gruesome a place. The sight that met my eyes as I stepped out upon a small ledge which ran before the entrance of the cave filled me with consternation. A new heaven and a new landscape met my gaze. The silvered mountains in the distance, the almost stationary moon hanging in the sky, the cacti-studded valley below me were not of Mars. I could scarcely believe my eyes, but the truth slowly forced itself upon me. I was looking upon Arizona, from the same ledge from which ten years before I had gazed with longing upon Mars. Burying my head in my arms I turned, broken and sorrowful, down the trail from the cave. Above me shone the red eye of Mars holding her awful secret, forty-eight million miles away. Did the Martian reach the pump-room? Did the vitalizing air reach the people of that distant planet in time to save them? Was my Dejah Thoris alive, or did her beautiful body lie cold in death? 
beside the tiny golden incubator in the sunken garden of the inner courtyard of the palace of Tardos Mors, the Jeddak of Helium. For ten years I have waited and prayed for an answer to my questions. For ten years I have waited and prayed to be taken back to the world of my lost love. I would rather lie dead beside her there than live on earth all those millions of terrible miles from her. The old mine, which I found untouched, has made me fabulously wealthy. But what care I for wealth? As I sit here tonight in my little study overlooking the Hudson, just twenty years have elapsed since I first opened my eyes upon Mars. I can see her shining in the sky through the little windows by my desk, and tonight she seems calling to me again, as she has not called before since that long dead night. And I think I can see, across that awful abyss of space, a beautiful, black-haired woman standing in the garden of a palace, and at her side is a little boy, who puts his arm around her as she points into the sky toward the planet Earth, while at their feet is a huge and hideous creature with a heart of gold. I believe that they are waiting there for me, and something tells me that I shall soon know. The End of A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs